Yes, and wait, where are, where'd we go? Let's try that again. Stay. Okay, yes. Okay, we are really going now. I'm Jens, uh, my colleague Pisin is gonna be doing uh, a demo at the end of the talk. So let's get going. So this session is gonna talk about peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking, a uh, bit of an introduction, general, talking about how couch-based lights replication works with peer-to-peer, -peer, how it's usable for that. And then we'll give a couple of uh, examples of actually implementing it. So I have an example app that uses Bonjour, um, otherwise known as MDNS, to uh, locate peers on the local network and sync with them. And Pacin's going to be showing another one that has a really interesting technique of doing direct pairing by scanning QR codes. So the overview. Um, I, probably everybody knows this bit, but when by real peer-to-peer -peer used in the real sense, not just as a buzzword, we mean that clients are connecting directly to each other with no server involved. And there's not even an internet connection involved since they can just find each other on whatever local connectivity there is. Uh, on iOS or Mac and iOS, this can actually involve using Bluetooth and tunneling Bonjour and IP through Bluetooth or through this infrastructure Wi-Fi mode, which is a way for uh, Wi-Fi clients to talk to each other without having a base station. So iOS devices and Macs actually have this ability to um, connect with each other even when there's not any sort of network available. So obvious benefits, like if you're a developer and you build a peer-to-peer -peer app, you don't have to worry about running servers, configuring them, bandwidth costs, etc. If you're an end user, there is the capability of having um, unmatched privacy, right? If the app is written securely, then uh, it, nobody but you and the people that you directly trust ever see the data. It doesn't go over the internet, it doesn't go to a server. The app can share data across the local network using high bandwidth Wi-Fi and never have to worry about um, slow cellular connections or um, limited bandwidth. And as I said, it's usable without, in, without internet infrastructure. And it's pretty easy, especially in Silicon Valley, to think that there's internet everywhere. But there are large areas in the country where there's uh, like no cell service. Uh, my in-laws actually live in an area like that, a nice beach community in California. Uh, there are a lot of areas like that, especially in rural parts of the country, in third world countries. There are wilderness areas where there's no connections. Uh, disaster areas where the infrastructure has been knocked out. There's actually been um, some use of CouchDB with its similar replication technology in uh, use by aid workers in disaster areas and refugee camps where there's no network but they can go out with their mobile phones and collect data and then come back to their central tent and exchange the data peer to peer. There are, of course, drawbacks. The, it's inherently kind of less reliable because a client device has less um, reliable or consistent connectivity than a server does. So you may not be able to connect at the right moment. Uh, how to identify people and to authenticate content are difficult problems that are, to some degree, still uh, actively being researched. It has troubles with scaling too. Like on a LAN, some of the naive approaches will uh, generate too much traffic as they scale. I'll go into that a little bit. And scaling beyond a LAN has problems of um, just being able to find other peers to connect to and being able to make the connections to them. So of course you can have hybrid approaches. You, um, you can have a server that just gets treated as another peer. So in this example, the blue devices on the left have peer-to-peer -peer connections to each other and are also connecting to a server, uh, while the devices on the right just uh, are you know, off the grid. And yeah, so if, if one of those devices that's on its own finds the server and connects to it, then whatever data those have been sharing can also make its way to the server and to the rest of the, the peers. So I, I kind of think of it as that a server is really just a well-connected peer. So if you've 
built your system for peer-to-peer, -peer, it actually transitions to being a server-based system really well. So how does Cloudspace Mobile tie into it? So the good part is that the, the architecture, the replication architecture comes out of CouchDB and it was built from the very beginning to support multi-master replication with uh, any topologies. So what that really means is that uh, the replication protocol algorithm just takes any two databases and will sync between them. So one side has the active replicator process that's, that's um, initiating the work. The other side ha is acting as a server. It's actually an HTTP server that's serving a REST API. And uh, they exchange data that way. So what goes on beyond those two servers doesn't matter. The, the replicator will do the right thing. And yeah, I should mention in the footnote that this is sometimes a point of confusion. Couchbase server also has a replication protocol called XDCR, which is not the same thing. Um, the, it would actually take a while to explain why they're different, but there, there are very different needs involved. And XDCR doesn't support this kind of multi-master replication that, uh, that Couchbase Lite does. So there are a lot of different topologies that are possible. I know that Wayne covered some of this, so I won't go into it too far. There's the star one is the obvious that everyone thinks about in a sort of typical client server world. The actual implementation of the star is usually, once you look into the data center, more like a cluster. So everybody by now is, has like caught on to putting a bunch of servers together, having them network together in what actually is a kind of a classic peer-to-peer -peer fashion, and then having the client requests routed to those for scalability. And there's an interesting point here that CouchDB is a server database, and the, one of the origins of the name Couch, which is sort of where the couch and couch base comes from too, since uh, couch DB is part of our DNA, was cluster of unreliable cheap hardware. So one of the ideas behind couch DB was that you could scale it up by just running a bunch of instances of couch DB and having them replicate with each other. Uh, then, of course, at the other end, you have this sort of arbitrary peer-to-peer -peer mesh where peers just discover each other on the LAN and connect to each other. So the, um, oh yeah. Um, so the way the replication protocol works is fundamentally pretty simple. The implementation gets hard, but it really just involves the two peers talking to each other. And so the one who's going to be receiving data says, hey, what's new? So what, what has changed on device A here since the last time that we replicated? And then A says what revisions are new. So in this case, it got this new revision three of that document. And then B looks at those and, and figures out which of them it doesn't have already. And since B only has an older revision of document one, it says, yeah, that one's new. And then peer A sends that one over. So what this does, since we can track all the documents by revision ID, that means if you've already received a revision from one peer and another peer offers it to you, you don't need it. So it um, avoids having redundant transfer of documents between peers. So that doesn't, it's not really any optimization if you have the star network, but if you have a, a mesh or some other system where you have loops in your connectivity, then this avoids a lot of redundant traffic. So back here in this example, so you know, the client there on the left creates a new document or a new revision of a document, and it either, either actively sends it to the other peers or it just like broadcasts somehow that it has new data and then all of these other peers will pull it over. Uh, there's, of course, one peer that it wasn't directly connected to in this mesh, but now that those other peers that it is connected to have it, they're going to advertise that they have a new document, and so it ends up going over there, too. So there's a problem, as I said before, with this. If you naively implement this and take it too far, you end up with something like this. So what that looks like is an order of n squared number of connections between the peers. I think this is, I counted this and it's 20. So you get 20 peers together on one LAN and you've got quite a lot of connections being made and quite a lot of traffic going on. So even if the revisions themselves don't get transferred redundantly, um, there is still this like metadata, this, this traffic between them saying, oh, I have a revision with this ID, do you have it? And the other one says, no, I don't have it. So that traffic itself can start to become a significant network load as you scale up the number of clients. So there, there are a number of real mesh network implementations. Um, I mean, not using Couchbase Lite, but just for doing IP networking over meshes. 
And they have some fairly advanced techniques that they use to eliminate this sort of thing, like spanning trees, which are a way of dynamically uh, creating the minimum number of connections on the land so that everybody is transitively connected to everybody else. And there are also things called gossip protocols where the clients will literally randomly connect to each other, checking to see if the other one has new data. And it's, you can show that if, uh, if you tune the parameters properly, that they will actually spread the information out pretty reliably. Not quite as fast as in a, a naive network, but it, it works quite well. So that is like beyond the scope of this talk. But I'd love to hear from anybody who tries to do stuff like this. And then also the wide area peer-to-peer, -peer, like trying to build sort of like you know, a worldwide network, also has um, different problems. The, the worst problem here is that peer discovery is really hard. If you use something on a LAN, you can take advantage of link local multicast, which is a way to broadcast a packet to everybody else that's on the LAN. And that is um, under the hood what Bonjour uses, and it's what various other things like um, uh, there are some other competing protocols that do similar things. They're all based on this idea of multicasting. But multicasting, of course, doesn't scale across the whole internet. So uh, discovering peers gets really hard, especially because um, peers tend to change addresses dynamically. They appear and disappear. There are distributed protocols that can do this sort of thing, but they are complex. And they, they can also get expensive. Like the amount of metadata traffic can get uh, quite a lot, depending on the size of your peer network. Uh, the other problem is that even once you've found a peer, just being able to connect to it is hard because these days almost all client devices are behind some sort of firewall or uh, network address translator that by default will block incoming connections. So um, you know the typical router, airport base station, or whatever that your home is behind does not accept incoming connections uh, by default unless you configure it to. Um, Cell connections, like uh, most telcos also just completely block any incoming connection. So it's not possible for someone over the cellular network to initiate a connection to your phone. Your phone has to initiate the connection to something else, which means that you can't have two phones establish a connection directly to each other over a cell network. So there are technologies for this. Um, discovery, people tend to use things like distributed hash tables, of which Kademlia is probably the best known one. BitTorrent uses a Kademlia hash table for discovery. There are a bunch of different ways of getting through NAT, some of which involve protocols for talking to the base station and um, telling it to open a port for you. And some of them are just uh, weird hacks, mostly involving UDP, that sort of fool the base station to thinking that it's actually an outgoing connection, not an incoming one. Um, and they have various levels of reliability. The, probably the best, uh, mo kind of most active supported thing right now is a technology that Google and other people are working on called WebRTC, which is built into some browsers, like it's built into Chrome by now. It's got a whole bunch of stuff and it's mostly aimed at um, enabling multimedia, like video communication between browsers but it has this whole peer-to-peer -peer communication layer underneath it. And I don't think anybody on the Couchbase mobile team has really dug into it too much yet, but several of us are quite interested. And like, we think it is uh, possible to somehow tunnel the Couchbase Lite replication protocol through this, which would have a lot of really interesting benefits. But uh, it hasn't been done yet. So let's get into implementation stuff. So, uh, the first thing that you need when you're running Couchbase Lite on your device is you need some way of letting another peer connect to you and either pull or push data. And the Couchbase Lite listener component is what does this. It's normally used as part of like building a phone gap application because it pro provides this REST API that then the internal JavaScript code can talk to on the device itself. But it also allows connections from the outside. So you just have to link this component into your app. You make one or two API calls to start the listener, and bang, you're now like listening on a TCP port, and you can accept replication on that port. So the way it looks is that we have a kind of stack here with the data store and then the Couchbase Lite API. The, the REST API becomes this alternate entry point into the data store that's uh, opened up through a port. And so another peer shows up, and you can point the replicator on that peer at the corresponding URL of your open port, and they can replicate with each other. So the way this looks in code on uh, iOS, and I'm, I'm using Swift here so that the, um, the Objective-C people can be sort of confused and not make the JavaScript, the Java people feel like 
they're the only ones being confused. So you just create a CBL listener instance, um, tell it what port you want it to listen on, and set it to read-only mode. Uh, the read-only mode here uh, uh, basically keeps anyone from pushing documents into your database, which is probably a, a good security thing to do when you just have an open port on your LAN. So what that means is that you can, uh, other peers can use it to pull from you, but they can't actually push. And the, the port number, you could give port zero, which would end up letting the TCP stack uh, just choose a random port for you, which is generally a good thing to do, except that uh, currently the replicator will see that as being a different URL every time someone tries to connect because the um, port number in the URL will be different. And that means that none of the optimizations for um, doing a repeat replication to the same target database will be in effect. So essentially every time it, the, somebody connects to you, they'll be starting over from scratch and asking you about every single document that you have. Uh, that's something I would like to fix in the future, but for now it's better to just pick some random big port number and, and use it. So now that you can publish yourself, we need to have the subscribe part. Um, so we use Bonjour for this. Uh, I've got this little Bonjour browser app that um, you can download. Uh, it's just freeware from somewhere, which is a really nice way of browsing stuff. So this gives you a way of, of asking who is running a particular service or app um, on the local network. And you can identify the service by a unique ID. So you, um, you advertise your own service, uh, which will sort of create this record published on the local network that uh, you're running a service of a particular type uh, with a particular name. The name is usually like the username or just some nickname that they pick to make it recognizable. And, uh, and uh, you tell it the port that you're listening on. And of course, the, the advertisement will include the IP address that you're on. And you can include a small amount of metadata in this. Um, by small, I mean it has to fit into a single IP packet. So you want it to be under about 1,500 bytes. Um, but that's enough to include some really useful stuff like uh, a timestamp of when your database last changed, which I'll get into. And then you, there's a separate API for browsing for, for um, services, given that same service ID that you've provided. And there are events that get called or callbacks that get invoked as other peers on the network go online and offline. So the, the implementation of this that's used on iOS is, is called Bonjour, which is Apple's trademark of underlying technology, multicast DNS and DNS service discovery, which are um, entirely open. They're published as RFCs. Uh, ZeroConf is another name that it goes by. There's a Linux implementation called Avahi, and on Android, it's called Network Service Discovery. So, uh, recent enough versions of Android, it says 4.1 there, um, support Bonjour under this other name of Network Service Discovery. So they will interoperate with iOS. And Windows doesn't, doesn't natively have this built in, but Apple has a, this um, open source MDNS responder that Windows apps can build into their app and uh, use for this. And I've uh, put in some URLs to the uh, iOS and Android uh, references for the documentation for those. So for advertising, uh, on iOS we have a, a handy method that you can use on that same CBL listener object. You just set the bonjour name, you just give the, uh, the user nickname, um, and then the service type, which is something you'd probably pick to be unique to your app, and the form it's in is like the unique string followed by dot underscore TCP. The, it's important to note that the, the service name that you provide, like you know, when, I'm, when my app is publishing something, it might use Jens or Jens's phone. Uh, this can sometimes be modified in order to make sure that it's unique on the LAN. So it, usually that happens by having a digit put at the end of it. So sometimes like if you're browsing for things on the network, you might see something like you know, Bob's Computer 2, something like that, where there happened to be a conflict on the land, so it got appended. So what this means is that you can't rely on the name that other people see being identical to the name that you're publishing. And another note that this API, the Set Bonjour Name API, isn't available on Android, although we should add something comparable. So you'll need to use the uh, NSD service info 
uh, class uh, in the Android APIs to do the equivalent thing. So to browse, you create this NS Net Service Browser instance. Uh, you set yourself up as its delegate and then tell it to search. And again, you, you give it the service type. The domain will usually be local dot, which means to search just on the local network. And there are then methods on your delegate class that you implement that will get called. So this is the uh, net service browser did find service and net service browser did remove service. So these will get called as new services appear and as they go away. And to connect to appear, so the, the service information that you get for browsing, uh, for performance reasons, it doesn't include things like the IP address of the peer. Like for complicated reasons, you, you don't actually know that yet. It takes more work to find that out. So to limit the amount of network traffic going on, you only look up the address of a peer once you want to connect to it. So to do that, you call resolve with timeout and just give something short like five seconds for the timeout. And then another um, delegate method will get called called net service did resolve address when the resolution finishes. And at that point, you can ask for the host name property of that service. And uh, it will give you a host name. It's of the form like foo.local. And you can just use that as a, a name to connect to it with. Uh, here, what we do is we actually construct a URL containing that name. So the scheme would be HTTP, because this is a REST protocol. Or if you know that the other peer is using uh, SSL, you'd use HTTPS. Stick in the host name, stick in the port, which is also a property of the service. And then the, um, the path is the name of the remote database. And then uh, from there, you can just use the, the regular Couchbase Lite replication API to start a pull replication from it. So uh, I actually I wrote a sample app that does exactly this and worked out some, uh, some best principles to use to make it work well. So the, the basic approach that you use is that you, the first time you launch your app, you come up with a UUID and you save that persistently. I'm storing it in a local document in the database. So that way, um, if somebody wants to, because you don't necessarily want to peer with everybody on your LAM. That doesn't make sense. So the user should be able to like, see a list of people and say, yeah, I want to sync with them and with them and with them. So we need some way of persistently remembering who them is. Uh, in a way that works even if the person decides to change their nickname. So uh, the service name will also include this UUID. So that's what the other peers can use to identify you by. In the service metadata, this, uh, it's called the text record, this stuff that also gets published along with you that has to be really small. What we do is we get the latest sequence, uh, I think it's called latest sequence number property of the database, and we publish that. The sequence number, like for for our purposes here, the important thing about it is it's a number that increments every time something changes in the database. So literally every time a new document or a new revision is created in the database, that sequence number will increment. So it's essentially kind of a timestamp, an abstract timestamp of the database. So by publishing this number in your record and updating it every time it changes, which you can do by listening for database change notifications, you are advertising to the other peers on the LAN like whenever your database changes because they can be browsing and they can, they'll get notified that your metadata has changed and that number is different. So then uh, when the user picks peers that they want to pair with or follow or whatever, you just remember the UUID of that peer and the latest sequence that they're currently advertising. And you store that persistently. Then when you're browsing, you know, when you're watching that peer and you see that it's now got a latest sequence that it's advertising, which is larger than the number that you stored, you know that it must have new stuff. So then you trigger a pull replication. So that little snippet in the corner is part of the screenshot of that Bonjour browser. And what it's showing is um, in the, the demo app that I have, the, the um, service type is called peersync.tcp. And so that the bold thing that starts with Mac and a long string of hex is the, uh, the service name that that particular peer is advertising. So what I did, I made up a format where it has the nickname at the front, and then the, in brackets comes the, uh, the UUID. So then I use a regular expression to parse that, and so I can see, okay, it pretty much ignores the, the nickname, but it looks for the UUID and says, oh, am I peered with this person? Yes, I am. I better start following that. So up next is the demo. I have a question. Yeah. A very basic question. You talked about limiting the scope of Bonjour advertising because, again, those CVs, you want them to see. How would you do that? 
The actual advertisements, you can't. So um, just by its nature, Bonjour, like it's broadcast to the whole land. It's the, um, basically it's, it's who, you, who you pull from. So the, the simpler way to implement this would just be to like, like iterate over every peer that you find on the LAN and start a pull replication from them, which you probably don't want to do. Yeah, well, part of what is being skipped over here or hand waved about is security. Yeah, so there are, there's not enough time to really get into that here. So. That is part of the, when, when you call resolve with timeout, that, that starts this asynchronous task where the Bonjour uh, daemon looks up the IP address and host name of that other peer. So before that, you don't know it. So what I've got here is uh, I ended up taking my uh, prototype peer-to-peer -peer code and hacking it into uh, Grocery Sync just so that it would have an actual app with content that you could show off. And I've pushed it up on a branch now, and I'll give the URL for that at, at the end of the talk. So if I run, so this is the first launch of the app. So it's going to ask the user for their nickname. And uh, so I'm going to give it Sim Jens because I'm running in the simulator. So I've got nothing in my database, of course. So I'm going to click this Follow button. And it's going to show me basically all the other peers on the LAN who are running. And if everything works right, I'm going to launch the equivalent app over here. Yep, so my phone just showed up as a peer called Jens Phone. And on my phone, if you can see the tiny thing here, I've already added three entries to my grocery sync database. So I'm going to click Jens Phone, say that I want to um, sync with that. I'm sure I'll pick Mac as well. Mac is a fake, um, another fake implementation of this protocol that I've got running on my Mac just for testing purposes. And I'll save that. So you can see here it's already like it's already brought in a bunch of stuff. So it's got WWDC ticket, iPhone 7, and dog from the phone, and a bunch of things that say fake task from the Mac. And so if I go through here, if I check off WWDC ticket, then uh, what this guy updated its Bonjour record to say that it had a larger sequence number. This guy noticed it, started a pull replication, pulled it down, and then the UI will display it. So, and it took like what? 1,001, 1,002, about two seconds. So, not bad. And that concludes that demo. So the next, uh, the remainder of the talk is going to be Pasin demoing his application, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So Pasin, you want to come up? or I can narrate for you like a ventriloquist. Name is Photodoc. Photodoc is a peer to peer photo sharing application similar to the iPhone AirDoc feature. But instead of using Bonjour, it uses something which is more directly, which is using the QR code. The flow of the application is pretty simple. So basically, so the receivers uh, show the QR code, and then the sender select photo, and then scan the QR code to send the photos from sender to the to the to the receivers. And here is the key is the implementation in a nutshell. So basically it the photo doc used the QR code for peer discovery and and use one time push replication to transfer photos. And it in it also used the digest authentication 
for for doing the authentic authentication <coughs> and and we also generate one time username and password a lot to, to for the authentication and it has the potential to do cross platform photo sharing and currently the app that they have is the iOS application and and James uh, in the back also I think he is currently working on the Android version of the app so once that is done so that we can have the uh, we can share photo between iOS device and uh, also Android device. Here is the storyboard of the application. So there are there are three simple view controller. The view controller is the entry point of the application. It presents off the photo from the camera row. It has the receive button and send button. And on the right hand side, it is the send view controller. Send view controller has the QR had the QR code scanner. And at the bottom, it is the receive view controller. So the receive view controller is for receiving photos and it has the, and it presents the QR code. Okay, so I'm going to like walk through the, the key implementations of both receive view controller and the send view controller. So basically the receive view controller has three main steps. So the first step, once the receive view controller gets loaded, it is start by uh, setting up the uh, the Couchbase Live listeners, and and here the port is equal to zero. This means that we are gonna let the Couchbase Live listener decide its own port to use. So this means that every time that that we would like to share the photo, the port gonna change every time. So the URL is not gonna be reused. And then after that, we enable the authentications. Uh, the authentication is the digest. This is supported by the Couchbase Live listener by default. And then after that, we generate the username and password. We use the iOS randomization service to generate both username and password. And then we send the both username and password to the listener for authentication. And, and then after that, we are ready to start the listener. Once the listener is started, we then generate the sync URL or the URL endpoint to the receiver database by using the listener URL, username, password, and the database name. And we save the URL into the sync URL variable, and we're gonna use it later when we generate the QR code. And then after that, we start the database change listener. This is the second step. We start the database change listener in order to know when the photo, like, when the, when, the, when the photo from the sender gets saved or gets synced to the receiver database, once that happens, we just extract the photo from the, from the chain documents and save them into the device camera room. And here is the last step of the receive view controller. So, so from the first step, we have the Cosmic Live listeners set up, and then, and then, and then, and then after that we we have the and then after that we set up the database shared listener, and we also have the sync URL. So now we are going to use the sync URL to generate the QR code. In order to do that, we use the iOS call image filter to generate the QR code. And inside the QR code, you can see that we have the listener host port and the database name, and also we also bundle the username and password for authentication. And now we are looking at the same view controller. Though there are three steps at will. So the first step is just uh, set up the QR code scanner and scan the and scan the QR code. Uh, in order to do that, we are using the AV Captain sessions, which is a part of the AV AV Foundation framework. So we just use that to scan the QR codes and extract the information. Uh, inside the QR code, which is the URL endpoint to the receiver database. In the second, so in the second step, we just iterate to each photos that we wanna send to the to the receiver. Uh, for each photo, for each photo, we create a document and then we attach the document. We, we attach the photo to the document and save to the database, and then we also save the the document ID 
send that uh, into the doc, doc ID palette, and that we're gonna use later in the next step. So here is the next step, which is the last step. So we have, we have the sync URL that we extract from the QR code. We have the photo documents saved into the database. So now we are ready to navigate the, those documents from, from the sender side to the receiver side. So here we create a push, push navigation with the sync URL, and then we assign the document IDs to the navigator. This means that we're going to ask the replicator to push only the document of those ID. So this step is optional, but just for something bad happens, so we just, uh, we also assign the document ID to the, replic to the replicator. And in the middle of the code block, we set up the replication change notification listener. We are doing this in order to know the, the current status or the current state of the replication. And at the end, we start the the replication to send the photo document over to the to the receiver. Actually, that is pretty much it for the implementation. You can notice that there are I I did not show a lot of short code because there is not much short code in the actual in the actual project. And you can see the complete short code uh, in the GitHub repo here. So go to the Couchbase lab slash photo doc. And next, I'm going to demo the application. So on the right hand side of the screen I have the on the on that side of the screen I have the I have my iPhone 6 simulator running with the with the photo dump applications. Let me close here. So that I can start from the beginning. And on this side is my uh, is my iPhone, so I'm gonna open the app. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna gonna send some photos from my iPhone device to the to the simulator. So on the simul simulator side, I select receive button, and now it show up the QR code. And on my iPhone, I select some photo, and then select send button and it show up the QR code scanner, and I'm going to scan the QR code to send those photos. It is sending photos. So that's it. So this is the end of the demo, and I'm going to hand it over back to Jen to conclude the presentation. The information you mean what inside the QR code? Yeah. The inside the QR code is the URL endpoint of the receiver database. Literally just that URL. We can do the Q and A together. Oh, any yeah. any more questions? Yes. They just need to be on this, well, okay, if you've got a local network, they just need to be on the same local network. Um, it really depends, like I've seen Bluetooth work up to about like, you know, 50 feet away, but sometimes, it maybe it depends on like how busy the environment is, but in some environments you have to be more like six feet away, it's, it's pretty variable. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry, like, uh, the question was like how, how far away the devices can be from each other for the peer-to-peer -peer connection to work. So what kind of security considerations do you have for peer-to-peer? -peer? Um, yeah, there was actually um, some slides that I skipped uh, uh, in the interest of time about that. So in my app, the, the, 
there are two issues in the, the app that I demoed. One is that uh, the listener is set up with no authentication, so anybody can just connect to you and either pull or just look at all the data in your database. So there's a sort of privacy issue there. Uh, the second issue is a really interesting one that uh, I had a slide for it. I don't, maybe I can see if I can get to that slide. It's a lot clearer if you can see it in the, in the form of a slide. Yeah, this one. Oh, oh, except that the font is missing, so those weird C-shaped things are supposed to be phone icons. So the, the problem is that um, documents will sort of end up getting passed between peers. Uh, and there's this problem that if, doc if peer A creates a document that gets synced to peer B, and then later on peer C comes around and connects to peer B and pulls in that document, like how do you know that that was actually created by peer A? It could just as well have been forged by peer B, like you know, even if it has some kind of an author property inside of it that says A. And the only real solution to this is to make the documents be sort of self-authenticating, which in practical terms means that you have digital signatures in them. And so then you have an environment where everybody has their own public key, you know, key pair or certificate, and the documents that they create are all signed using their key, and then you, when you pair with somebody, you get a copy of their public key so that you can identify documents from them. So I, there were several slides there that I skipped because I ran out of time, but I, that's something I have been working on and sort of in my spare time. So those are sort of the two security issues that I know of, the, the main ones. Yeah, the, t the two modes that I know of that are in use are Bluetooth, um, since you can tunnel IP through Bluetooth, and uh, infrastructure Wi-Fi, which is that mode where um, Wi-Fi clients can connect to each other even without a base station. And unfortunately, it looks as though the, the protocols for all that are proprietary. Um, I don't know if there's any open ones in development, but the ones that Apple has implemented, they have not released the specs, and it sounds like they are not interested in releasing the specs for competitive reasons. So I don't foresee any interoperability there across platform. But if you are all on Apple devices, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, front? So the question is, when you start the listener, um, what uh, like network interfaces basically does it connect to? Um, that's kind of a complicated question. I'm not sure I know the, the answer entirely, but I think by default, it will connect to all the available IP interfaces. So on a phone, that means Wi-Fi. Um, there, in the slide where, where I was setting it up, there was a line I didn't mention that says, like, uh, listener dot, um, no, it was when browsing. When, when browsing, you say uh, enable peer-to-peer -peer equals true. And that tells the Bonjour listener to look for, uh, for these other network modes like Bluetooth. And... I believe that when you advertise a service, it also, as part of that advertising, will enable it to connect through Bluetooth. But I don't really understand the details of how it works. So there, there might be more information in somewhere in Apple's documentation about that. I'm, I'm not really sure. We're done? Okay. Um, how about we like informally talk over there? <laughs>